Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Psych 3530. Today, uh, we'll be going over section four of our factorial ANOVA lecture. So uh, section four is going to be all about uh, practicing the our interpretations of main effects and interactions, typically using a line graph. Uh, we're going to really focus on interactions here in particular and talk about the different types of interactions. We've, we've really only talked about interactions in general over the last three sections, uh, but in this section, we're going to focus on the different types or the, the, the sort of shapes or um, looks that an interaction can have and, and what they mean and how they might uh, ch slightly change some of our interpretation of those interactions. Uh, then we're going to finish up this section with a discussion of variations on factorial ANOVAs. Okay, so we're going to start down here with our discussion of uh, interpretation using line graphs, like I said, and then move on to factorial design variations. So um, we're going to see lots of line graphs and not bar graphs. Technically, they um, they convey the same information, right? It's just um, building a bar up to that point of the line, right? The, they don't really differ in their uh, in the information they convey. Uh, but line graphs are much better for visualizing interactions. Uh, bar graphs are maybe uh, a little better at visualizing main effects, although line graphs are perfectly um, uh, good at conveying main effects. But line graphs are particularly good at conveying interactions. So we're going we're gonna to focus on those here in this section. So uh, let's just dive right into an example. Uh, this experiment has uh, two independent variables, each with two levels. So we just have a our basic simple two by two factorial design. Um, and the focus of the research here is uh, memory is going to be our outcome. That's our DV, items recalled. So number of items remembered. Uh, our first independent variable is participant type. We have two groups. We have child chess experts and adult chess novices. So children who are amazing at chess, uh, future chess masters, versus adults who uh, maybe don't really know how to play chess or are uh, beginners at chess. And what we're gonna ask them to do is remember different types of information. That's our second variable, type of item that they're remembering. Our first level is <clears throat> chess pieces, specifically in this experiment. Uh, this is actually a real experiment, by the way. These data are not made up. Um, in this experiment, the uh, the experimenter asked the participants to remember the layout of chess pieces on a chessboard versus just remembering a string of random digits. So that's our two types of information. So we're going to have children chess experts who remember the layout of chess pieces. Presumably, maybe their expertise is going to help them remember the layout of chess pieces versus child this, those same child chess experts just remembering a string of digits of numbers. Then we have adult novices who are going to remember the layout of the chess pieces and adult novices who are just going to remember a string of numbers. So we actually have um, Independent variable number one is a subject variable, right? This is not something we can manipulate. These people just fall into one of these categories naturally. And independent variable number two is a true independent variable that the experimenter manipulates. What's a little different maybe about this experimental design than some of our examples in the past is that independent variable number one is a between subjects variable, right? This splits people into two different groups. Whereas independent variable number two is a within subjects variable, because if we look at how this is set up, these child chess experts do both of the conditions for independent variable number two. These same children remember chess pieces and those same children remember digits as well as the adults. And that's something we're actually gonna bring up at the end of this section uh, is this sort of distinction 
between whether your independent variables are between or within subjects and what that means for your uh, research design. So let's take a look at the results. Um, you can see on the right hand side, these um, experimental group means have been graphed in a line graph. On our Y axis is the number of items recalled. On our X axis is our independent variable number one, participant type. And then our line colors distinguish uh, our independent variable number two or the type of information remembered. So what I want all of you to do is maybe take a minute, press pause, and I want you to think about and look at this line graph and consider is there an independent, I'm sorry, is there a main effect of participant type, right? Do child chess experts differ from adult novices regardless of the type of information? So independent variable of participant type. Is there a main effect? I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Main effect of independent variable number one participant type. Is there a main effect of independent variable number two, which is type of information? And then do we have an interaction between the two variables? So maybe press pause, take a minute, uh, give that interpretation a try, and then uh, press play when you're ready to walk through it with me. Okay, so let's walk through this interpretation. First, let's consider the main effect of independent variable one participant type. So. We want to consider all the data points on the left-hand side of this graph. We wanna average them together, right? We average across the other variable. So the average child chess expert remembers 7.7 .7 items. The average adult novice, if we sort of eyeball average these and we can tell exactly what the average is over here at the marginal means table, the average adult novice remembers 6.85 items, regardless of what that item is, right? We average together chess piece, their performance on chess pieces and digits. So if we sort of visualize this difference, as well as maybe incorporate some of our information from the marginal means table over here, I think it would be reasonable to say that child chess experts seem to have slightly better memory than our adult novices right? 7.7 .7 items versus 6.85 items. That's almost an, a whole item uh, on a scale of 10. That's a pretty substantial difference. Um, we, would, we would be, I think, not incorrect to say that it looks like we have a main effect of participant type, right? It looks like child chess experts uh, are just have better memory in general than our adult novices. Let's consider independent variable number two, right? Now we're looking at the lines themselves, regardless of um, the participant type. So we're comparing just the average for chess pieces versus the average of digits. And if we look at sort of the midpoint of these lines, right? So we wanna take the chess piece line and we wanna average this point with this point, right? And so we'd get right about the middle of the line. We wanna average for digits this point with this point, we get right about the middle of the line. And we see a smaller difference. Uh, and again, if we refer to our marginal means table, we see a, a smaller difference than our other independent variable, but maybe there's still something there, right? This is uh, a, a 0.65 sort of advantage in memory for chess pieces over digits. Um, so maybe we have a small to moderate main effect of uh, of independent variable number two, such that chess pieces are better remembered in general than digits, regardless of who's doing the remembering. So I would say we'd be pretty confident that we have a main effect of participant type. Uh, we'd be less confident, but I think maybe correct to claim uh, that we have a main effect of uh, type of item. And here's how you want to sort of visualize that uh, midpoint of each line that I was talking about. Okay, now let's interpret the interaction. We have a rule of thumb here. 
which is that if the slopes of the lines differ from each other, then you probably have an interaction. I'll say that again. If the slopes of the lines differ from each other, then we probably have an interaction. And that's actually the same information as the difference of our differences, right? Think of uh, one of these difference scores essentially as the slope of the line. And if those differences differ, we have an interaction. The same thing occurs with uh, looking at the graph, right? These, the slopes of these lines differ dramatically. In fact, they completely cross over one another, which we're going to call this a crossover effect or a crossover interaction. This is the most dramatic type of interaction. And if we, uh, and by dramatic, I guess I mean like obvious or substantial. So if we look at our means table and think about the numbers, then it becomes really obvious that an interaction is occurring because child chess experts, maybe not surprisingly, are really good at remembering chess pieces and much less good at remembering digits, right? They have a substantial drop off for just remembering numbers, which seems strange, right? Just remembering a string of numbers seems like it would be easier than remembering the layout of chess pieces until we remember that these are the child chess experts. They have expertise in remembering the layout of chess pieces, right? That's what they do. Versus uh, just remembering digits reflects maybe their pure memory capacity um, without their expertise. And so we see a really big drop off when they move from chess pieces to digits. But adults have the opposite pattern, right? We completely cross over. Adults start out with not very great memory for chess pieces. Not surprising because they're not chess experts, right? They're, maybe they're unfamiliar with chess. They might not even know what the pieces do. And so they don't have the expertise to apply to remembering the layout of those chess pieces. So their performance is much worse than the child chess experts when it comes to chess pieces. But when the adults move from chess pieces to digits, they get better, substantially better. They increase their uh, items recalled from just under six to almost eight, right? 5.9 to 7.8. So whereas child chess experts decrease their items recalled, right? They're their memory gets worse when they remember digits. Adults have the opposite pattern. Their memory gets better. And we see that in our line graph, right? If we, uh, if we look at our child chess experts here on the left-hand side, right, they do much worse on digits than they did on chess pieces. And our adult novices have the opposite pattern. They do better on digits and worse on chess pieces. Again, we can also think of the interaction from the perspective of the of the other independent variable type of item. So let's think about digits. When digits are remembered by children, it's much lower than when digits are remembered by adults. And we have the opposite pattern for chess pieces. When chess pieces are remembered by children, it's much better than when they are remembered by adults. We have a complete crossover interaction. So this term crossover interaction um, is our, what you might call the classic interaction. Right? It's the, it depends. So if we think about that example, I'll go back one slide, sorry. If I asked you, well, how good is the memory of a child chess expert? You would have to say, well, it depends upon what they're remembering, right? How good is the memory of an adult chess novice? Well, it depends on what they're remembering. Right? So what is the effect of type of information on participant type? Well, it depends. The child chess experts are really good at chess pieces, but not at digits. The adults are really good at digits, but not at chess pieces, right? The effect of one variable depends upon the other variable. And that's the essence of our crossover interaction. Now we can have another type of interaction that's common called a spreading interaction. And instead of it depends, it's best to describe these interactions as only when, right? Only when. Meaning the impact of independent variable two 
has an effect on only one level of the other variable, but not the other. So in this case, the lines maybe meet at one of the independent variables, and then they die at, at one level of one of the independent variables, but then they diverge at the other level of the independent variable. So this little example down here at the bottom, uh, our y-axis is the proportion of times that your dog sits. Our first independent variable is uh, essentially our behavior, right? What we're saying, we're either saying nothing or we're commanding our dog to sit, right? Uh, our other independent variable is whether we are holding a treat or not holding a treat. So let's break down this spreading interaction. If I'm not saying anything to my dog, then it doesn't sit very much, right? It has a low proportion of sitting and the dog doesn't care whether I'm holding a treat or not holding a treat because I'm not commanding it to sit. So there is no difference between holding a treat and not holding a treat at this level of the other independent variable saying nothing. But when I move to commanding my dog to sit, then we see a distinction between the other independent variable. When I command my dog to sit and I don't have a treat, right? nothing changes. The dog ignores me. He says, screw off, you don't have a treat. I'm not doing what you say. Versus when I'm holding a treat, now the dog listens to my command and sits. So the effect of whether I'm holding a treat or not holding a treat depends upon the other independent variable and it matters only when i say sit right so uh when does it matter if you're holding a treat or not holding a treat only when i command the dog to sit and not when i say nothing so the effect of the presence of a treat is only apparent at one level of the other independent variable the effect is not apparent at the other level of the independent variable. So when we encounter examples that have various combinations of main effects and interactions, we want to consider that usually the interaction is the most important piece. Now, that doesn't mean that we can ignore the main effects. We're still going to have to report them. We're still going to have to interpret them, right? They, they exist. They're there. They're real. They matter. But the whole really purpose of doing a factorial design is to get that interaction. And so if you get an interaction, we want to sort of play up the interaction and maybe play down the main effects. That doesn't mean we can ignore the main effects. It just means that we recognize that the interaction is the good stuff. It's the meat and potatoes of uh, of this effect. And it's really going to, to be the place where we want to spend our focus and our, and our energy communicating this finding to someone else or to the public. So... If we were to provide a, a little interpretation of these results, our child chess experts versus adult novices, right? Our research question was, does participant type child expert versus adult uh, have an impact on memory, number of items recalled, and does that depend upon the type of information being recalled? So our interpretation might sound like the study showed no main effect for participant type or information. Turns out it didn't, even though it kind of looked like it. Uh, we didn't look at our ANOVA table uh, like we did last time, uh, but you'll just have to trust me on that. Oops, sorry about that. But we want to play up the interaction. But the interaction showed uh, that children who are chess experts perform better than adults when they're recalling chess pieces and adults perform better on memory recall uh, when they're recalling strings of digits. Okay, so here we have a series of slides. I'm just gonna uh, click through them really quickly so you can see how many there are and I'm talking about, right? We've got two slides with all these different graphs. Um, these slides are essentially all of the things that can happen in a two by two factorial 
design. Uh, we're going to use the example of young drivers versus old drivers, cell phone, not cell phone. Um, and what's our, uh, what's our DV here? Um, causes more accidents. Okay. So, uh, our DV, our, uh, our outcome is number of car accidents. And so using this two by two example, the, uh, this series of graphs illustrates all of the possible things that can happen, right? We can have this dramatic crossover interaction, which will result in no main effects, as you can see, right? That's sort of similar to the example we saw with our uh, chess children, that this dramatic crossover interaction yields no main effects, but we have this crazy interaction where clearly something is going on. In this example, we're illustrating a main effect of age, but no main effect of cell phone use and no interaction, right? There's, there's no crossover, there's no spreading, nothing is going on with our interaction here. The only thing we're observing is that younger drivers are causing more accidents than older drivers, regardless of cell phone use. So here we have two slides, right? I want you, what I want you to do is go through the next, I believe, six examples. So the last two here, and then all four on the next slide. I want you to pause um, my recording and go through those uh, six examples, trying to interpret them. Uh, maybe don't peek over here at the summaries. Uh, just do your best to use the, uh, the means tables and the figures uh, to work out your interpretations. Uh, then press play, and I'll uh, sort of talk you through the next six examples. So go ahead and press pause and take a look. Okay, I uh, hope you're back. Uh, maybe you just kept it rolling. That's fine. Hopefully you actually press pause uh, and, and attempted this for yourself. So let's look at this third example. Um, we can look at our marginal means, and we can see that it looks like cell phone use has a main effect, right? That people on cell phones cause accidents at a much higher rate than people not on cell phones. And we can see that it doesn't look like age matters at all, right? We don't have a main effect of age. And so both of our lines, which represent younger and older drivers, are basically right on top of each other because younger and older drivers don't differ at all, right? They have exactly the same scores, 10 on a cell phone, four not on a cell phone, 10 on a cell phone, four not on a cell phone. So we see our dramatic main effect of cell phone use, such that people on a cell phone cause more accidents than people not on a cell phone, regardless of whether they are young or old, right? So no main effect of age. And so clearly we don't have an interaction either, right? Nothing is going on with an interaction. We're simply observing a main effect of cell phone use. Kind of like how up here, there's no interaction. We're simply observing a main effect of age. Here we have our first spreading interaction. So uh, do we have a main effect of cell phone usage? Yeah, it looks like that people on cell phones are gonna cause more accidents than people not on cell phones. Our average for not on cell phones would be about right here where my laser pointer is. And we can see that that's reflected in the marginal means table of 10 uh, versus seven. Looks like we also probably have a main effect of age such that younger drivers cause more accidents on average than older drivers. But we have this interesting spreading interaction. So let's talk through it. Uh, for younger drivers, does being on a cell phone matter? No. Cell phones don't matter for younger drivers. These data suggest that younger drivers cause accidents regardless of whether they're on a cell phone or not, right? 10 on a cell phone, 10 not on a cell phone. They're dangerous no matter whether they're on a cell phone or not. Older drivers, however, are causing many fewer accidents when not on a cell phone and only become dangerous drivers when they're on a cell phone. So this is our only when, right? Um, so only when older drivers are on a cell phone do they cause accidents. 
versus younger drivers who cause accidents all the time. So let's look at our fifth example, this top one up here. We can see that we have, uh, looks like two main effects, right? We have a main effect for age, such that in this case, younger drivers are sort of better drivers overall than our older drivers. Being on a cell phone, again, is still more dangerous than being not on a cell phone, right? That's this average versus this average. And we do have an interaction. Remember, it's not maybe a, a, a dramatic crossover interaction, but the slopes of our lines do differ substantially. Now, this one is a little more difficult to interpret because it's not as dramatic. It's not as obvious. So we really need to think about what's happening here. Let's, let's take uh, our age groups one at a time across cell phone use. So let's look at younger drivers. When they're on a cell phone, they commit more accidents than when they're not on a cell phone. And they have a pretty dramatic fall off, right? Uh, this is a big difference for our younger drivers. But for our older drivers, the effect of cell phone use is even more dramatic. Look how steep their slope is, right? So uh, young drivers go from eight to two in accidents as they, as they get rid of their cell phone. But older drivers go from 12 to three, a much more dramatic shift. So we can think about the lack of a cell phone, right? Giving up your cell phone reduces younger drivers accidents by six, but giving up a cell phone reduces older drivers accidents by nine. Their slope is much steeper than the younger drivers. So we would say that this is probably going to be an interaction. This example right here, the second one on this page, is an example of nada, nothing, zip, right? Everybody's the same. Every condition scores a five. The lines are right on top of each other. They're just straight across the graph. There's nothing going on here, right? No interactions, no interaction, no main effects. Here we have uh, another crossover interaction such that for younger drivers, cell phone use doesn't matter, right? They cause five accidents in either condition, five on a cell phone, five not on a cell phone. But for older drivers, cell phone use does matter, right? They are much more dangerous on a cell phone than not on a cell phone. We have a complete crossover. Their slopes differ wildly. Um, and so we would say, well, what's the effect of cell phone use on driving? Well, it depends upon your age. The effect of cell phone use is nothing for young drivers, but the effect of cell phone use is dramatic for older drivers, right? Cell phones are dangerous for older drivers. Uh, cell phones do nothing for younger drivers. And lastly, we have a, a final spreading interaction here where, um, uh, and this is maybe a bit odd theoretically because of the content of our example, but let's just interpret it as it is. Um, so this is a spreading interaction. So it's going to be an only when. So I could say, uh, I could ask the question, do younger and older drivers differ in the number of accidents they cause? Do younger and older drivers differ in the number of accidents they cause? And you would say only when they use a cell phone. When they're not on a cell phone, they're the same right? They're both causing five accidents, right? They're younger and older drivers are equal when they're not on a phone. But when they're on a cell phone, then our participant types deviate from one another. They differ only when on a cell phone. Being on a cell phone makes younger drivers more dangerous. And for some reason, being on a cell phone makes our older drivers less dangerous, right? They actually decrease their accidents on a cell phone, whereas younger drivers increase their accidents on the cell phone. So here we have a, a spreading interaction, right? Only when. Here we have a crossover interaction. It depends. Here we have nothing. And here we have a, a, an it depends interaction that's just not as dramatic as a full crossover. And so this one is actually... Um, a little more troublesome to interpret, as we saw. 
Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to move on to um, the end of this section, the last five or six slides, and discuss some variations that we can have on these factorial uh, experimental designs. So we're going to start making this distinction between um, an independent group's factorial design, a within group's factorial design, or a mixed factorial design. You might also uh, see this independent group's design called a between subjects, right? So that's what, really what we're talking about. Uh, between subjects, factorial design, a within subjects, factorial design, or a mixed factorial design. Then we're gonna talk about what happens when we increase the number of levels for, uh, for our independent variables, and then adding an independent variable. Okay, so in a independent groups or between subjects factorial design, both of your IVs create independent groups. I'll say that again, both of your IVs create independent groups. So uh, think back a couple sections ago to our example about light men and heavy men versus drinking and not drinking, right? Each of those variables creates an independent group. You're, you're either a light man or a heavy man and you've either drank or you haven't drank, right? You can't cross over um, the levels of either of those variables. They are both between subjects variables. And when both of your variables are between subjects, you end up with what we call a between subjects factorial design if you think about your Punnett square, right, with you would create four groups from this two by two independent design. And so if you needed 50 participants in each cell, you'd end up with 200 participants, right? 50 times four, because within each of those cells, all of our people are independent of one another. They are, uh, the, they are between subjects manipulations of our variables. versus a within groups factorial design where both of our variables are manipulated within groups, right? The levels are within groups manipulations, meaning that everyone receives every level of the independent variable. <clears throat> so um, you can think about if we have, let's see, what are our variables here? Um, an alcohol photo versus a plant photo um, and neutral words versus aggression related words. If we have an independent groups design such that we manipulate these variables creating uh, a between subjects effect, then the people in each cell are different people, right? We have 12 people here, 12 more people here, 12 more people here, 12 more people here for 48 total participants. In a fully within groups design, I'm basically taking these 12 people and then having them experience version one or cell one. And then I'm taking these 12 people and I'm moving them to cell two. And they uh, experience this condition and I collect data. Then I take those same 12 people and I move them to cell three. They experience these conditions and I collect data. And then I take the same 12 people and move them to cell four or experimental group four. So even though I end up with 48 data points, I only have 12 subjects, only 12 people. Now, something interesting that you could do is what's called a mixed design. This occurs when one of your variables is between subjects, but the other variable is within subjects. So uh, in this case, it looks like the photo condition is between subjects, right? I've got 12, um, I'm sorry, the, the photo condition is gonna be our within subjects variable. Nope, I had that right the first time, sorry. Our, uh, our photo condition is between subjects, right? These 12 people are different from these 12 people. But then everyone experiences both levels of this other variable of the word type, neutral words versus aggressive words, right? I take these people, numbers one through 12, and I move them down to also experience this level of the uh, word type variable. 
Then I take these 12 people, people who are numbered 13 through 24, and I move them down to experience this level of the other independent variable as well. So I have one variable, photo type, that splits people into independent groups, right? We've got persons one through 12 versus persons 13 through 24. And then I have one independent variable where people are moving between it. They're experiencing both levels, right? Persons one through 12 experience neutral words and persons one through 12 experience aggressive, aggression words. Persons 13 through 24 experience neutral words and persons 13 through 24 also experience aggression words. So we end up with three design types, independent or between subjects, within subjects and a mixed design based upon the nature of the manipulation of each of your independent variables. If both independent variables are between subjects, then we have an independent or between subjects design. If both independent variables are within subjects, then we have a within groups factorial design. And if one of the variables is between and one of the variables is within, we have a mixed design. Now, the big deal here, if we want to, uh, to notice is the number of participants that each of these designs will require. An independent, a fully independent groups design will require the highest number of participants, right? Because no one is repeating a single cell, right? If you, you're in cell number one and that's it, you're done with the experiment, you don't move on. So I need 12 different people in each cell versus a completely within groups factorial design where all of my subjects repeat the experiment, in this case, four times with different conditions, right? So the same 12 people are moving through the experiment, meaning a fully within uh, groups design will give me the fewest participants. And then a mixed design is in between, right? Okay. So um, we tend to talk about factorial designs and teach about factorial designs in the most simple format, which is a two by two factorial ANOVA. Uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, I think especially maybe in section one, they don't have to just be a two by two, right? Depending on the nature of your variable and your research question, um, we might add levels to, uh, to our experiment. So um, let's go back to our drivers and cell phone use. I could take that and make it a two by three where uh, I keep driver age as two levels, young and old. And then I add a third condition to my cell phone variable, maybe hands-free cell phone, handheld cell phone, or no cell phone. I believe earlier in our example, we, we said it was something like, uh, talking, texting, no phone, right? That, that's just based on how you define those levels, just based on your research question. But uh, I could just add a, a sort of intermediate condition here, and I would create a two by three factorial design. And now I have six experimental conditions, right? I have six cells rather than four. And so our graph gets a little more complicated, right? We're, we're still gonna be able to interpret this, uh, in much the same way as we interpreted our other graphs, but we have this third condition. So uh, the graph gets a little more complicated and perhaps difficult to interpret. Now we can really go crazy with our distinctions and our levels and our independent variables. Take a second uh, and think about this example on the right. Um, what would our nomenclature be for this? And it's not a two by two, but what would we call it? Take a second and think about it. So we would call this a four by three or a, a three by four. It doesn't matter which way uh, you say it as long as you get the number of levels correct, right? So we have four levels of age. Right? We decided to distinguish not just between young and old, but 20 to 29, 30 to 49, 50 to 69, and then 70 plus. And then we kept our three levels of cell phone use. So we end up with a four by three design. Uh, look over here at this graph, and you can see that things clearly get even more complicated because we've added more levels. We have um, four times three, so that's 12 
different experimental conditions, 12 different cells. And so it's going to be more difficult to interpret this outcome. It's not as, as simple and straightforward. One of the things we need to think about is that this provides more information. This is a lovely study. Um, it, it would be perfectly reasonable to do the study this way. It, it provides us a, a more sort of discreet look at driver age. We, we get more information because we're not lumping these people into just two general categories. We're creating four categories. So we, we learn more. We learn things from this experiment on the right about age that we wouldn't learn from the experiment here on the left where it's just two levels. So this is good. It gives us more information. Um, but it creates some other problems. We have more experimental conditions. That means either more participants, right? If this, if we do this as a between subjects design for, uh, for hands-free, right? Obviously driver age has to be between subjects. You can't be simultaneously 25 and 35. Um, or if we're going to do cell phone use as a within subjects variable, it means that each of these subjects now has to participate three times. So it's taking up more participant time. Uh, and with that, we get also the, the general uh, potential negative effects of a within subjects variable, things like practice effects or carryover effects that can come into play. So on one hand, this is great. We get more information. On the other hand, uh, increasing our number of levels causes this to become more difficult to interpret. So we might make a mistake in interpretation, or we might not communicate uh, the findings as clearly as they should be communicated to our readers. And uh, the design itself has uh, some drawbacks when we start adding levels, meaning we either need more people or we need those people to do the experiment more times. This is a much larger endeavor. This will take more time, more money, uh, from the side of the researcher as well as the side of the participant potentially. So uh, some definite advantages and disadvantages to making uh, this shift. Now, of course, we can also add another variable, not here talking about levels, but talking about adding a third variable. This makes things really complicated. It's even more complicated than uh, adding levels. Now, um, for our purposes, we're not really going to, to be working on interpreting what we call a three-way design or a three-way interaction. Um, we're going to be sticking with interpreting these uh, two-way interactions, but we just need to know that this exists. This is perfectly possible and plausible and reasonable, and people do it, um, but it makes things complicated. So we have now uh, the same dependent variable, breaking onset time, so how quickly you break. We have our cell phone variable, hands-free versus no cell phone. We have our age variable, younger drivers versus older drivers. But we've added a third two-level variable, which is the presence of traffic. So the question we're asking here is um, a sort of multi-part. Right? Does cell phone use matter? Does driver age matter? Does traffic matter? Right. Those are our main effects. And then we have lots of interactions. Does cell phone use interact with age? Does cell phone use interact with traffic? Does traffic interact with age? And do all three interact with one another in addition to our original interaction, which is do, does cell phone use interact with driver age? So there's a lot going on here uh, in order to plot a three-way interaction, we actually have to use two separate graphs. So we can see here that uh, our y-axis is breaking onset. Uh, our x-axis is hands-free versus cell phone use. Our lines are still young versus old drivers. But now the graph on the left is light traffic and the graph on the right is heavy traffic. And so to interpret this, we have to essentially say, uh, to interpret the three-way interaction, what you have to do is you have to say, is there an interaction in light traffic? And does that interaction differ from the interaction in heavy traffic? And in this case, it actually looks like we do have a three-way interaction, right? So the relationship between age and cell phone use differs based upon whether there's light traffic or heavy traffic. 
When there's heavy traffic, the only thing going on uh, is a main effect of age and maybe a, a, a small main effect of cell phone use. But when we have light traffic, there's a spreading interaction, right? So this relationship differs from this relationship. So we have a three-way interaction. Again, uh, you're not gonna really be required to do any interpretation of these. Just know that it's possible and that they exist. All right, that's it for section four. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for finishing up factorial ANOVAs. Uh, this is the end of sort of this chunk of the PowerPoints. There will be um, another section of PowerPoints that we'll have another voiceover for that's about APA style uh, write-ups using our ANOVA tables uh, and interpretation. So uh, that'll be the, the last chunk of information for factorial ANOVAs. But thanks for listening and have a good one.